Let me ask you a question. Imagine this. Imagine you want to become a history teacher. You go to the university, you find a buddy there who also wants to become a history teacher, you actually click. You both put the same dorm, you do everything the same, you study together, everything is going great. You both graduate with honors, then you both start teaching. His classes, though, very interactive. Everybody's happy, they want to be involved. Your classes, uh, not so much. People are kind of bored, they're on their phones. It's annoying. And then your buddy tells you, hey, I think I know what you're doing wrong, but your ego says, no, 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 it's okay, let me figure it out myself. Next year, same thing, same question. I think I know what you're doing wrong. And no, 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 not necessary, I'll figure it out myself. And then finally, after three years, you're gonna go, okay, please, let me know, what do you believe? And he gives you that one little nugget. And that little nugget changes everything. And boom, your classes are interactive. If something like that would happen again, would you immediately listen and take that advice? Of course you would. You learn from your mistakes, that's what you're doing. Now I'm here to tell you to learn from your mistakes that you're doing right now. Because the chances you are breathing incorrect are 95%. If you are an endurance or stamina athlete, please check out o2trainer.com. Go there, this little device can change your life. Go and check it out. We all make mistakes. The thing is though, you have to learn from your mistakes. You know, when you're younger, you do stupid stuff, right? Alcohol, I mean, even when not fighting, let's not talk about fighting for now. Let's just go over, over what can go wrong. Um, most stupid stuff, well, I did that as well, but that was outside fighting, drinking. Drinking, doing drugs, and you do a lot of stupid stuff when you're drunk or you are on drugs. Actually, I talked to a cop, um, multiple cops, but they all tell you the same thing. 85% or higher from all the people who are in jail is because they're drunk or on drugs. So, what that means is that you're gonna have to stop the drinking, but that's not how we're wired. We're very, mm, it's pride. It makes us think, oh, I can do it again. I will never do that again. They don't realize that the alcohol or the drugs are actually making you doing the stupid stuff. So. Uh, uh, you see this with movie stars, uh, Reese Witherspoon. I, uh, I, I believe I talked about her a while ago. She was caught drinking and driving and then a body camera was there and they were filming her and boy, oh boy, she is drunk and she says, oh, do you know who I am? She tried to get out of it, which is something everybody would do. And then the internet goes to town because look at her, who does she think she is? She's drunk for crying out loud. You know, what am I? Worst things was exactly that. I would wake up in the morning in Japan, let's say after a fight, of course, because before a fight, I would be perfectly straight. I wouldn't think a drop. I would be perfectly straight. But after the fight, winning or losing, there's always a reason to celebrate, right? I lost, boo, boo me, I drink. I'm happy, hey, I won, I drink. But then in the morning, I would wake up and many times I did that same freaking stupid thing. You know, I would knock, go to the room of my buddy, Leon, who was my training partner, he was with me a lot of times, and I would knock on the door, he would be still be sleeping because I would wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh no, please don't tell me I did it again, please don't tell me I did it again. Knock on his door, he goes, what? I go, dude, did I do it? He said, oh yeah, you did it. I go, ah, then I would just walk back to my room and I would fall asleep. Now, what was I doing? It was when we couldn't get in the nightclub, of course, and I'm drunk out of my mind, and then I go, do you know who I am, you know? So we all make those stupid mistakes and we regret it, but unfortunately, we get drunk again or do stupid stuff again, and, or, or drugs again, and then we do exactly the same thing again. Look at Mel Gibson. What happened to his career? He is drunk out of his mind and they're filming him. Doesn't say that something? You know, that's the police should have never released that video. They know what they're gonna do with it. You know, about how people are gonna react. But no, 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 apparently it's all for likes and it's all for promotion. You know, look at this guy being drunk. Yeah, and you say, say stupid stuff. All the way back, this is a long time ago because Mel, I actually know Mel and he, uh, he doesn't drink at all. He doesn't even wanna smoke a cigar with us because that could trigger him to smoke cigarettes. And then he says, if I smoke cigarettes, that could trigger me to drink, you see? So he completely cleaned up his life, but he just made a mistake. That's the thing, you know, and we, unfortunately, we are people, we judge others on what they do wrong. 
we forget about everything else that they did right and perfect and helping people. No, 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 no. It's all about what they did wrong. Well, it's fun to point a finger if you have a miserable life and point finger at other people who are successful but who fall, you know, because sometimes the pressure can get through these people. I mean, all day long, they get bombarded everywhere. I always talk about I have the, the perfect amount of... Um, being known. People say, you're famous. I'm not famous. I'm not a Justin Bieber or, or, or Kevin James when we're walking on the street in a foreign country. Cannot even get a pizza slice because if one person recognizes him, you got 150 people following us. They can go to the grocery store and people bothering the whole time. And you say, oh, but it's bothering. They're just fans. You have no idea what some fans do. You have absolutely no idea. You can be eating with your family. They come over to the table. Everybody wants to make a picture. And if you don't, then you are the bad person and they're going to type about it, they're going to, they're going to tweet about it, whatever they want to do, they bring it on social media and then suddenly, because everybody has the same thought pattern, now I'm a bad person because I said to a guy, excuse me, can you let me eat dinner with my, uh, with my family? And right away after, I'm happy to make 10 pictures with you. But even when I say that, no, 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 they walk away and they're angry because they can't wait for 10 minutes. What about shaking hands with somebody if you're eating hamburgers? I don't know where this guy's been. I see many guys when I go to the urinal, they go, they leave the urinal without washing their hands. And that's always in my mind. So if somebody comes up to me and wants to shake my hand and I bump my fist and they want to shake hands, I say, sorry, but I don't want to do that because I'm eating. You see, mm, now I put him, if he didn't wash his hand, everything that he touched, I put it on my hamburger and I'm going to eat it. Think, just think, put yourself in a different situation, in, in that person's situation. And then uh, you should be okay with that. An example that I've used many times, and if you never heard it, this will bring you home right away, is this, right? Uh, if you don't know a certain situation and you assume this person is bad, imagine there's two channels, and I talked about this before, as I mentioned, and uh, you see them on the top of a roof, and there's a whole bunch of kids crying, screaming, everybody's there, like nine years old, you know, and I'm grabbing these kids and I'm throwing them off a building. You want to put a bullet in my head. You want to kill me at the spot right there. But then there's another news channel who decides to tell the whole truth. And they zoom out. And now you realize I'm on a burning building. And down is the fire, uh, the firemen are downstairs with one of those big pillows, whatever you call it, where you can throw people to safety on. I'm throwing these kids to safety. So 10 seconds ago, 15, 20 seconds ago, you want to put a bullet in my head. And now because you know the story, now I'm, super, now I'm a hero. That's a big thing. So before you judge people, think about what is going on in their lives. Conor McGregor, oh, he messed up. He, oh, he messed up. And yes, you know, but I give people a pass. I put myself in that situation. Being 28, 30 years old, 100, 200 million dollars in the bank, and that was done. God knows what he has now. Everybody's saying yes around him. And then you, you judge that person. Yeah, but he, because he should stop drinking. I know, but it's not so, so easy for some people, you know, because I'm talking about myself. The only way that there's not too much craziness out there for me, and I have to be the truth there, you know, it's because there was no social media when we were competing. I mean, there were some crazy moments that I did. Now, the pride moment, already said that, at the door, do you know who I am? I would never do that. I think it's so stupid to do something like that. Guess what? You drink 30 beers, yeah, then you have a problem. 30 beers, yeah, you see? But I understood I had a problem, so later in life, thankfully, I realized, wait a minute, there's a pattern here. Every time when I do something stupid, it's because I'm drunk. Let's stop the drinking. Oh my God, a whole new world opens up and suddenly you stop making that stup those stupid things. People who write tweets when they're drunk. I had that when I woke up in the morning, oh God, and I'm looking at my text message, what did I write? Because you don't know anymore. You go back in that and then you realize, okay, I shouldn't do this anymore. Unfortunately, if you're an alcoholic, like I am, you know, you start drinking again and then you make exactly the, stape, uh, the same stupid mistake. That's what I always say, you know, you, you only change when you hit rock bottom, when something really bad happens. How many times do you see uh, kids, uh, high schools or, or even universities that get completely drunk, boys, girls laying on the ground, their pants all wet because they peed themselves, you know, people making pictures, put it on social media. You will believe that is rock bottom. Nope, two weeks later, same story. They do it again. You have to learn from your mistakes. And if you make those mistakes, you have to find out what is the mistake. And once you know the real mistake, it's the drinking, then you stop. So whatever is bothering you, you're gonna to have to stop that. That's again, when you hit what bottom, 
then you learn from those mistakes. So, so now let's transform this to uh, something else, right? Let's transform this to fighting. What can go wrong in fighting? Well, there's a lot that can go wrong in fighting. First of all, don't drink when you're training. You know, if you're stupid enough to do that, you might get injured also because if you have a hard workout, you know, but you drank, uh, uh, drank the day before, dehydration. All the guys, and I was just talking about it with George and Pierre last week, um, it's like, what, because he, he pulled something. I say, did you just arrive from a flight? And he goes, how do you know? I go, because you're dehydrating in the air. And once you dehydrate, you have less fluids in you, your tendons are, and, and your muscles are susceptible to getting injured. You have to watch out for that. He says, that make total sense. You gotta load up. That's why you don't wanna drink, especially when you're a fighter and you have to go in training camp when you're traveling. The reason I found this out was uh, the dehydration part was, and I told George this, uh, when I fought Kevin Rennelman, uh, at that time, they had two weight classes. They were going to make weight classes. When I arrived, this is where a heavyweight division was established. And I believe the other one they called middleweight. It was 200 pounds and over and 200 pounds and under. Well, I was a heavyweight, so I had to be over 200 pounds. But I was training high altitude in Colorado. And I started cramping before the, uh, before the fight, like days before. I thought it was so weird. I had no clue what I was because I didn't um, weigh myself. So I jumped on the weight scale. I'm in my jeans and my shirt and everything on, and I'm 197. And they tell me, okay, you can fight, but you can't fight for the title. I said, why not? So you have to be over 200 pounds. I said, one moment. So my buddies were drinking waters. I said, give me all your waters. And I started drinking everybody's water. I drank way too much because the next time I jumped out, it was 2.03, but I didn't want to miss it, of course. But that showed me that training high altitude or flying high altitude is dehydrating you. There was this drug a long time ago, it became a date rape drug, but before that, everybody was using that because it would make you, it was good for your kidneys, good for your liver, produces some more growth hormone, and it was a natural drug, GHB. But unfortunately, some morons, you know, started doing really bad stuff with that and it became outlawed. But I remember at that time when athletes were using that to go to sleep, if they couldn't go to sleep, they would get in injured the next day. A friend of mine was a power lift, he tore his biceps. And I go, can I ask you a question? Yeah, did you take GHB the day before? So how did you know that? I said, dude, I'm telling you, it's that crap. You gotta watch out because you start sweating a lot and dehydrating. You see, you have to learn from your mistakes. This is very important. But not only that, there's more things that can go on in fighting. Eating the right food. You know, how do you figure that out? I talked about this one time, but if you never saw that episode, is if you're a professional fighter, what I would do, this is what I actually did, I did for a month straight, I would write down every single thing that I ate. Even if it's a peanut, I would write that down. A little extra glass of Red Bull, doesn't matter. Write everything down that you took. And then, once you have that established, you also, at the same time, you're gonna find out when your workouts were the best. And I'm telling you, you're going to see a pattern. At a certain moment, after a month, when you did that and you wrote everything down, you say, those da days I was not feeling good while I was training. And then you pick all those days out and then you look back at what you were eating or drinking and 100% almost certain it was something that you ate before. An example that I used before as well is like, um, and, and I believe it's over 60% of the people, there's a lot of people are allergic to shellfish and lamb meat. That is weird, right? I can eat it, I love eating it, I take it all the time, but if I take it before a workout, it builds up more like that acid. I, f I don't feel good, it makes my muscles feel tight. Well, if you never did that, and you never knew, and now you have to fight it the day before you decide to go to a sushi place, and you eat a lot of shellfish, you might have a problem, or you ate a big lamb, piece of lamb, you might have a problem the next day. That's not a fun way to find out. Other things, what can happen, emotions. Before a fight, if you get your emotions, I'm gonna come back to a fight that I did later when we start breaking everything down, you're not in control. Look at the world right now, you know? How many people are freaking crazy because it's all emotion-based. We see this in politics, they point one thing out from a certain politician, and if that is bad, then the whole politician is bad. It doesn't work like that. Look at the other things that he did, or she did. It doesn't really matter. Find it out. Don't judge before you do it. Emotions also make you make stupid mistakes. Emotions in fighting makes you aggressive. And once you're aggressive, oh boss, but that's good in fighting. No, every fighter will tell you, although there's some fighters who need that, you know, but I need to have total control. 
And if I don't have total control, then if I want to knock somebody out, and normally I do it from here, poof. If I'm angry, I'm doing this. I'm telegraphing. Now I give my opponent notice on when I'm going to punch. Because that little load up is half a second, but a good fighter will capitalize on that, and then you get knocked out. I'm, like I said, I'm going to show you a fight. It was the only fight in Pancras where I was emotional. I will tell the story about it later on. And I was just swinging for the fences. Thankfully, I knocked the guy out because I just had a lot of fighter and he didn't have a lot of experience. But they made me so angry, something that I figured out the day before, that I just, I just was livid. Big mistake. If you have a girlfriend, if you're married, and, 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 and she doesn't understand the sport, well, there's two things you can do, right? It's either you quit the sport or you have to quit the relationship. Because if the relationship is in such a way that it affects your fighting or the day before the fight, she's holding you back, then, you know, you, well, you have to make a choice. What do you love the most at that moment? If it's her, choose her. If it's the other one, choose the other one. And of course, this is for female fighters exactly the same thing, right? It works both, both ways. Um, forgetting things. You go on a plane and you decided to pack your, uh, your fighting gear, you checked it in the luggage. And the next day is your fight and boy oh boy, they lost your luggage. That's a mistake you make once. Because now you're fighting with some stupid mouthpiece that you have to make hot in and uh, not a professional one. And that is the worst thing there is. You put it in your mouth, it can fall out of your mouth. It's very dangerous. You can lose your teeth. I mean, come on, guys. We're already beating each other up. You want to make sure that you keep that under control. It's very important. But also your favorite fighting gear. I have my lucky shorts in uh, Japan. Uh, the one that I fought my first fight and the second fight in. And then they passed, pushed me. Uh, Funaki and Suzuki had dinner with me after a fight. And they gave me like two new outfits fits perfectly nice he says please don't wear that anymore because it looks horrible boss it was all torn up it used to be dark purple but it looked pink because it was too many times but it were my lucky shorts you see so i had to recap that in my mind started training with the gear they gave me and then those became my lucky pants i know this sounds stupid you know it's um I said, are you, uh, are you superstitious? my answer now to people when they say are you superstitious i say no it's bad luck to be superstitious think what i just said that's a joke. That's right. See, it's an oxymoron. Anyway, so watch out for that as well. You want to always make sure that you have everything with you. So no emotions before, now before the fight, and the opponent gets inside your head. What can possibly go wrong? A lot can go wrong. Look at the Diaz brothers. Look at Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm. Ronda was always in everybody's face. Boom. And everybody was afraid until she met Holly Holm. And it was full at the weigh-in. And then, okay, you know what? Let's, let's, let's turn that around. I'm going to come back to this right away because it first happened with Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor. Because, same thing, McGregor is always in the face and people kind of are, are intimidated at the time. From, they can act like they're not, but it's affecting them in, in fighting. Very smart thing. I, Miyamoto Musashi would do things like that. He's the greatest swordsman that ever lived. You know, get in the opponent's face. Make him angry because then they make mistakes. And I remember when the, they stood face to face and then uh, Nate Diaz flips him off right in front of his face and Conor loses it. He gets angry. He hits the face, tries to kick him. And I remember my, my son-in-law, my future son-in-law, they're going to get married next year. He said, dude, he lost it. He's going to lose the fight. I go, ah, come on. He lost the fight. And then it happened the same with Ronda Rousey and Holly Holm. She got in her face, tries to intimidate, and Holm just stands there for whatever. And she said, Ronda realized it didn't work. She gets angry. And now suddenly there was this commotion going on. And I'm looking at him, uh, at, at Shaq, that's the guy who's going to marry my daughter. I go like, you think the same thing is going to happen? Same exact thing happened. So... Emotions are very important. So if you are able to put emotions in the head of your opponent, very good. I would do this all the time. I would do this with walking to the ring. There were moments, and, and, and you heard me talk about this before, when the, 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 the production would tell me, because my entrance music is going, but that is really long entrance music. And it started with a heartbeat. Gong, gong. Gong, gong. And then you hear the voice, it was from a Stephen King novel. This is it. It's dangerous. Dum, dum. It opens doors. Dum, dum. Doors to the pleasure of heaven for hell. I can hear you. I get goosebumps now because I'm thinking about this fight. This was so freaking crazy. But it would take a minute and a half. 
And you go, a minute and a half is not long. It's very long if your opponent is already waiting in the ring. So the production would shout at me, go, go now, you need to go now. You, you, and, but I said, no, I'm going to wait. No, you go now. I said, I decide when I'm going to go. Shut up. I'm going to decide. I don't want to get emotional to this guy because it could affect me in fighting. You see, there we go again. But I was just waiting. Let the guy wait and be annoying because he wants to fight. That's where he came. But now he's cooling down and you're just taking your time to go to the ring. Boom, winning the fight. Then the next time, I would come up with that song, everybody's head, above the bad, 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 bad. But I would come in that part, there's, there's a dip in the music where you, but that part, that's when I would start, and then I would run through the ring. So now this person thought I was going to take my time again, but now suddenly I was in 20 seconds, I was in the ring. See, I throw him off again. And that's what you need to do in fighting. Now, I like to stay away from politics and religion and all that stuff. I think it's too much. I wouldn't do that. Connor touched on that. You see, but that's him, his style. Look what he did. And look at the attention he brought to, uh, to, to mixed martial arts. We were talking about it last weekend, but Ian Gary was there. Dude, my mother knew, uh, knew, didn't know anybody. She knows Conor McGregor. So he gained so many fans for us by just being that person that he was. Because if you meet Conor, you're going to go like, what? Dude, he's a really nice guy. First time I met Nate Diaz. I thought, oh, here we go. But I'm a big Nate Diaz fan. And I go, uh, hey, excuse me, uh, Nate. And he turns around and goes, hey, boss, oh, my God, hey, man. And I'm looking at him. I was in shock because I thought he was like this guy who's flipping everybody up. He goes, ah, yeah, come on, relax. We just relax. It's always, you know, but this works really well. I go, dude, completely different person. When you meet a person, Tito Ortiz would do exactly the same thing. A lot of people hated Tito. A lot of people loved Tito. Well, whatever they do, love or hate, they're going to buy a ticket because they want to sit there or either he's going to get beat or either he's going to win. You see, very smart. He was one of the first guys actually who started doing that. And of course, Chiel Sonnen and everybody came along, you know, because they see, hey, it works. Muhammad Ali, that's the epitome there. I, I, I almost say Muhammad Ali and Conor McGregor was almost at the same. That's how good Conor McGregor did his, uh, his crap talking, so to say. So... It's very important. You need peace and calm also before the fight at home in your whole training camp. So please, fighters, doesn't matter female or male, make sure your partner is okay with you being a fighter. Um, I talked to Elizabeth Randleman, uh, the wife uh, from, unfortunately, from Kevin Randleman, who unfortunately left us way too soon. I'm still in contact with him uh, and his son and, and his family. And, and she was talking about me, uh, to me about um, certain fighters would come to their home and they would already be a champion. And then they had these new girlfriends. And these new girlfriends, they think it's all glamour. You know, they're going to sit first row and everything's going to be okay. You know, and oh, look at me at this. No, it's not. It's freaking hell. You're going to have injuries. You're going to come home. You're not happy. It's not fun. But my wife had to deal with me with my injuries. I'm not a fun person. Most of the time like two weeks before the fight, I would just move and go to a different place if I was injured a lot because I'm not a happy person to be around. I don't want to be like that to my wife. I don't want to be like that to my kids. You need peace and quiet. And of course, it always triggers your partner. It's logic. We're human. So even if you, you know, um, if they understand you're a fighter, enough craziness will make them snap as well. Now, if that snap just happens like on fight week, that could affect you already during the fight. So I told Elizabeth right away when she was telling me the story, Elizabeth Renneman, I said, I'm going to interview you. I'm going to interview about exactly this because she told me she would take these ladies outside away from the group and then she would tell them, do you know where you're getting yourself into? Because it is not all glamour. And then she would start naming the things that can go wrong. And Trust me, with every fighter, I want to see the first fighter who's going to say that he, he went to a fight without an injury. I don't think you find one. Everybody has injuries all the time, and it gets in your head. You got to watch out, because if your ankle, I had an ankle problem one time. I was stupid enough to go running in the woods the day before. I figured I'm not going to spar anymore, but I freaking hurt my, my ankle really bad, lay there on the ground for like five minutes or so. I go, dude, can I even come walk home? And I came to Japan and I, I, I acted. I taped it up. Nobody knew that it was. 
Guess what? In the fight, first thing my opponent attacks, goes for a freaking toe hold, which apply, it's just applied on your ankle. It's almost like I was sending out a signal to him. You see, so you have to watch out with these kind of things. Don't worry, I got him in a guillotine choke. Ooh, so I still got him. But I just want you to understand that all these little things can affect you. So bring your fighting stuff with you. Don't go to a crazy sushi place, a McDonald's sushi place somewhere the day before the fight and get food poisoning and then blame it on that. You the idiot. You shouldn't do that. If you had a whole training camp and you decide to waste that and throw it away by going to a shady place to eat the day before, bring your own food. That's what I used to do to Japan. I heard the crazy stories. I heard that people say, oh, I drank, the, they gave me water and I got a little tired, you know. That happens. Stuff like that can simply happen. So you have to make sure that that never happens to you. So everything that you do needs to be methodical and needs to be in place with what you want. That's why fighting is a very big, um, it's, a, it's an ego thing. You know, it's, a, it's all about me, 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 me. And it's for other people who are on the outside and don't understand it, you know, that could be that could be trouble. You have to watch out for that, you know? And of course, the fighters, sometimes you have fighters who bring that ego, also bring it to the other side, or to outside of fighting. That's not a good thing. And it happens to the best of us. It happened to me. It happens to the best of us. We all make mistakes. Don't judge people on their mistakes. Trust me. Judge them on what they did in their entire life. If I'm looking at a fight, at a fighter, I'm going to face a certain fighter. I'm not going to look at his last two fights. You know, that's... I'm going to look at all his fights. And from fight one, there's always something that a fighter all the time does the same. Try to find a counter for that. You know, even if it is pushing a fighter, when he moves back, he always moves to the right. That's something that you can use during a fight. You see, so don't look at the last stuff. And that's the same with people. Don't judge people on the latest stuff they did. Judge them in their entire lives. I hope that helps. And now we want to go to fighting, of course. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, my fight against Ken Shamrock. My last fight against Ken Shamrock. This was the fight that made me the fighter that I am now because I lost. And I'm very bad with losers, uh, losses. And that was the third time I lost by way of submission and I just got very vocal, started asking everybody if somebody wanted to train with me. In Holland, it was very hard to find a guy until I found one guy and he started training with me, Leon van Dyke. I never lost a fight anymore just by making that decision. But this fight, what can you learn from a loss? Well, first of all, I was never down. Also, I, you heard me say this before, I was never down after a loss. I simply knew that, well, I made a mistake and I got to make sure that this, what now happened to me, will never happen again. And if I do that, I'm actually a better fighter going into my next fight. You see, use it as a positive inspiration to never fight again. So. For this fight, I went to uh, Japan and I trained with Funaki because I never had a training partner. I had only one guy, of course, like I said, Leon van Dijk. But that's only so much you can do with one person, right? I need new bodies and that I can roll with who do things that I've never seen before. Because if you can create a way to a certain submission and, uh, and that your opponent never saw before, you're going to catch him with it. You know, I, I, I submitted high-level high level, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy, uh, ground guys with a move that I came up with. And the only reason I submitted them with it is because they never saw that move before. They weren't ready for it. Now, will it happen a second time against a high-level guy? It will never happen again. Their computer is so freaking insane, they load it up. It will never happen again because they already find the defense for it. Or they can actually stop it before it even starts. So with me, what I... Um, did I tried always to make different setups for same moves. Uh, armbar from the mount, see if you can do it in four different ways. You know, and mixed martial arts, you can throw in a punch here, punch there, boop, and then suddenly you can go to a submission, you can fake to the left, you go to the right. There's a lot of things that you can do a little different than other people do. And if you succeed with that, and he never saw that that same way, then, well, you're going to be successful. Now, I lost against Ken. So I'm going to Japan to train with Funaki Mazukatsu. Uh, first time, he uh, took him, me under his wing, and I always thought this, I'm a, I'm a conspiracy theorist here, you're going to hear that, but I'm not taking anything away because Ken would have beaten me anyway. You know, whatever happened, because at that time he was just a much better ground fighter than I was, if it would go to the ground, I would lose anyway. But there was something weird going on. I learned an, uh, the defense for a knee bar, and uh, they told me that he was going to push his knee, he would sit in half guard, and he would slide his knee over your hip and then go for a knee bar. So that's the only thing I did for three and a half weeks straight. 
train that, train that. Oh, you don't need to know more? I said, I think I know all the other submissions, how to stop it. I think I'm good. This, because Ken is really good with freaking lag locks. I want him to stop. Uh, I, I want me to stop that lag lock. So he told me the way, told me the way, told me the way, told me the way. And then suddenly we're in the fight. And instead of sliding his knee over my hip, he threw his leg over my head. And he did it from such a position that I was constantly safe. He was in half guard sitting and he was pushing my arm down and he made me think he would like go for the, uh, a figure four lock, which you can't pull out off in that particular case. Well, you can there's certain ways because I tried something that you can do. But my attention went to here and suddenly he throws his leg over my, over my head and he gets me a knee bar and I lost. I mean, this fight is like a minute and boss was caught, boss lost the fight. Hmm, okay, so what do I do? Well, make sure that that will never happen again. What would they have told me? What they, what they should have told me is very simple. If somebody sits in half guard, you don't want to get knee barred, hold the leg that he needs to throw over to the other side. Doesn't matter if he slips it over, throws it over, if you hold that leg, he can never knee bar you, it's very simple. But they didn't say that, slide the knee over. But the distraction also got me because he put himself in such a position, he was leaning over and then threw the leg over. You know what, let's take a look at this fight. He's gonna step it over your hip. So I was looking at my hip and not anywhere else. See, I'm looking at my hip and he swings it now over my head. So he told me the wrong way. He should have told me, just hold his leg, nothing can happen. Anyway, ouch, yeah, that was ouch. That was the first time I felt the submission during a fight. Normally, the adrenaline is rushing through your body and you don't feel pain. <laughs> I can tell you, I felt that freaking thing. I, that's the same as when uh, Funaki got me in the toehold. That was my very first loss. I remember the next day on the plane, my ankle was freaking blown up. And toeholds, I mentioned this all the time for the people who never... Uh, who don't know what a toehold is, it's not like you're holding your toes. <laughs> it's some, I saw somebody break his shin bone with a toehold. So trust me, it's a very painful lock. It's, it's kind of for your ankle, but it also affects your knee. Well, in that particular case, which was John Lober versus Yanagi Sawa in Japan, uh, his shin bone was weaker from the, the two things. Normally the joint goes out, the knee joint or the ankle joint, but with him, the shin bone was weaker and his shin bone broke in half. So, okay, so this happened. Bad, bad, bad. I need to find an, uh, a counter for that. So I got home, got very vocal, found one training partner. I talked about this before, just in this talk as well, Leon van Dijk, and we just started working out, working out, working out. Now we go three fights further. And then I face Maury Smith. Guess where I got him with? And guess what setup I used for Maury Smith to get him with? Well, you look at the same fight. They look at this fight. To do the same thing, watch this. I'm gonna push his arm down. Exactly like Ken Shamrock did with me. And then I go for the same knee bar that Ken Shamrock did to me. And voila, it actually works. Yep. And that's how you win fights. Losing a fight, then using exactly the same technique, because I tried it out in training, and I go, hey, it works. And then while I was sitting in the same position with Maurice, I go, hey, why not do it? And boom, and now I want to fight for it, with it. So I learned from my mistakes, and now I want to fight by it. Let's go fast forward. I'm fighting the Chiyoshi Kosaka. I talked about this. I'm not going to talk about this now anymore. It was a heel hook that I saw a day before on TV uh, on a big screen. I said, hey, that's a cool move. I had John Blooming next to me. He was the 10th degree Kikushin. He was the, the, the guy just below Masoyama, who's the founder of Kikushin Karate. And I said, hey, that's a cool move. I should remember that. Next day, I'm in the fight. And I'm sitting in that position. So I figured I might as well try it. But I never did it before. So I grabbed his heel, I fell backwards, not realizing the amount of pressure I put on his knee. Same thing as that story I told you with John Lober, his knee and his ankle, they were stronger, so his shin bone snapped in half. Yeah, that was really bad because I really liked that person as well. Even when I don't like the person, that's an injury you, you simply don't want to do. That's a bad thing to do, but I broke his shin bone. Then I believe Ken Shamrock did something um, to another fighter and he also blew his knee out and another person another blew his knee out so pancras said no more heel hooks okay no more heel hooks okay how can i learn from that well can i come up with something 
that is exactly the same in where I don't hook the heel. And what do you know? I found out. So for the people at home who understand ground fighting, when the, for an inverted heel hook, the leg is here, instead of hooking the heel, what I did, I grabbed the heel and I pushed the toes down. That's exactly the same move. I kind of did that move also later. I'm going to show you a video clip of that. That's going to be freaking awesome because nobody clapped. There were like three people who clapped, applaud, but guy goes, ah, he's in pain. But it was the, the coolest move ever. i show you that in a bit. But first of all, I did this move to Guy Metzger. And Guy is a friend of mine and, and, and it, it went too hard. Um, he, he hurt his knee with it, which I felt really bad about because like I said, Ken was all, I was always hanging out with Ken and Frank and all these guys, and then you have to fight them. You, you know, you don't want to do damage. If the guy is a crap talker, you know, still, do you really want to do damage? Kind of not, you know, but at least then it's something that you don't really care as much about because he was just a very bad person before, but guy was a great guy. And that is the heel hook that I did. I pulled the heel and pushed the toes, which is the same move on the leg. You apply exactly the same technique, but you're not hooking the heel. So I found a way around it. So let's take a look at that fight here. They tell Guy not to stay there, and that's right, because this is the thing. Oh. Yep, that was it. And like I said, I felt bad about that. Guy, by the way, is a doctor now. Imagine that. Hey, how cool is that? Yeah, he's always uh, been a good friend. Uh, very nice guy. It's cool because uh, my daughter dates somebody who lives in Dallas and he's got a gym in Dallas. He says, anytime you want to come, they want to come, set it up. And if there's any trouble, you just call the gym. <laughs> it's always good to know that people have our backs, you know, for something when something happens. Okay, that fight in where I did not pull the heel, but I just pushed the toe. And now you're going to go, that's something? Okay, this is my fight against Inagaki. And, um, and he's also, we're sitting in leg lock position and his foot is over here because for an inverted heel look, so the leg is coming to the other side. His right leg is on my right side. And instead of pulling the heel, I'm leaning forward. I'm pushing his knee down. And the only thing I'm doing with my hand on the toes, I push the toes down. Well, if your foot is like this and you push the toes down, you see, it's the same move that you're doing. I wasn't pulling the heel, which I could. As soon as I'm pushing, I can fall backwards and grabbing the heel. I didn't even know, to, uh, didn't have to do that. I was just pushing the toes down. And when you see him, he's like freaking pain. But then uh, maybe three people clapped because it, yeah, it looked like I wasn't doing anything. But now you know what I was doing. So let's take a look at that fight. Here it is. Watch what I'm doing. This is beautiful. I push his toes down with all the power I have, and he's screaming out loud now, watch. Ouch. And listen, I could have pushed his toe all the way down. I could have reversed his foot like a freaking, what is it, 90, the next one, 160 degrees, whatever it is, uh, uh, three quarters. And that would have not been good. That's how powerful that move is. So if you're a submission guy, lock that up in your mind and leg locks are legal, you really want to go for that move because you're in a leg position, leg lock position many times. And that's what you can do because if you lean over, you can actually stop him from peeling the hands off. Normally when you go for a heel look, they just peel the hands off. But now you can stop that by simply pushing the toes down. So it's a really cool little move and it works perfectly. Now, now I'm going to talk about somebody else, Funaki Masakatsu. Oh, he got me. Well, he didn't get me with it. But he found a way also to not hook the heel and to use this actually his neck. Now, I have no clue why I did not tap on this move. Uh, because if you see it, you go like, that leg shouldn't be in that position. So what he was doing... The leg is also for inverted heel hook. But bitch, by the way, you can also do it in your neck and roll it into a knee bar, but that's a regular heel hook. But for the inverted heel hook, he would, some people, they would stretch their legs under here because then it's harder to hook the heel. Now with us, heel hooks were not legal. So what he did, he passed the leg and he puts the toes in his neck and then he pushed the heel to the side. Now, if you look at my leg in this position, you're gonna go, what, even me, when he had it on me, I saw my leg being bent all that way and I go like, I'm not feeling it. This is the weirdest thing. So then I got out, thankfully, I escaped it. But let's take a look at that clip because you see, he got very inventive and he found also a way to do it, which I later also used with a regular heel hook with a toe in my neck 
push it over and rolling him into a knee bar. I'm going to show that fight in a little bit as well. Okay, so here's Funaki doing that move on me. I did a tap though. <laughs> Deep in enough, nothing's going to happen. Now watch this, what he's going to do. I can still not believe that I escaped this situation. He's going to reverse my foot upside down, watch. He's going to pull my, look my heel. My heel is as up as my knee is. It's turned 180 degrees. For some reason, God was on my side that night and I didn't tap. So I go, that's a cool move. Wait a minute, can I do that as well with a regular heel hook? So the leg is straight and it's both on this side. Put the toes in the neck and you really want to grab the toes, of course, because you want to have ultimate leverage. Sorry. Grab the heel and then pull it. Yes, you can tap on that. And this is the greatest thing. What a lot of uh, fathers will do, they will roll out. They try to roll out. But if you know that that is the only way to escape, you can right away roll it into a knee bar and then you got him into a knee bar. So here is that move for you. And now, instead of making a heel hook underneath my armpit, I do it in my neck. Watch this. I grab his heel, I push his heel, and I pull it to the side. And there we have a heel hook from the neck. And you remember me saying, stay away from emotions in the fight. Right? That's what I started this whole thing with. Um, I got emotional one time. So I give you the story real fast. They actually, and I will show you this as well, I have the comic to back up what I'm saying right now. They literally made a comic out of it in Japan. So uh, I'm fighting uh, Randy Couture. I was supposed to fight Randy Couture in October. I don't know what, the, I think it's 97 uh, in the UFC. Uh, and then Pancras called me because I was already away from Pancras for, because uh, I, I just parted away from him because I wanted to fight in the UFC. And then Pancras called me and they say, hey, the audience went a little bit down. If I was really, would come to Pancras and fight one more fight, and that was in September, I go, guys, this is September, you know, October's ready, Couture is a freaking animal, you know, I, I don't think it's a smart idea. Um, and they said, yeah, but it would really help us. Well, they did a lot for me. I really liked the company, so I said, okay, but now I'm going to ask you, first time in my life, do not give me a strong opponent because I don't want to hurt my hands. I don't want to hurt my kicks, uh, with, uh, kicking elbows. I just want to take this guy down. I'm going to submit him. I don't want to do anything, but please don't give me a strong opponent because I don't want to be injured going into the fight with Randy Couture. They said, okay. So I'm getting this new guy, Kengo Watanabe. So the day before the fight, I'm walking with uh, um, Guy Metzger on the street in Tokyo. And he told me, hey, boss, you know that they trained this guy especially for you, right? I go, excuse me. He said, no, they trained that guy especially for you. They started training him when you, uh, Funaki lost to you, even before that already. I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, this is a guy who's a professional rugby player. He's a big guy. He's a strong guy. And they started training him before you already beat him. But then when you beat him, he got so angry and he wanted to take revenge. So they started training this guy for you. Whoa, what? They told me they were just going to give me an easy opponent. And sure, it was the guy's first fight, but he was a professional athlete. And the guy got trained personally, so it was not what they said it was. Not in my head it was. Now I'm getting angry. And I'm getting emotional. And I say, screw everything. I don't care if I'm going to hurt my hands. I'm going to knock this guy out now. I'm not going to go for submissions anymore. This is over. You see me during the fight, there's a moment when I hit him on the ground, which I never did. I did it once with the Funaki Mazukatsu. But one time I hit him on the ground, and I remember the owner from, uh, from Pancras at the time, because they just changed owners. He walked up to me in the corner. He says, please don't hit him on the ground. I say, you started this, dude. You started this, but I was livid. But now I'm going to show you the fight, and you're going to go like, is that a professional fighter? I looked so clumsy. I was all over the place. Yes, thankfully I had big power and I got him, you know, and, and, and that's why I won the fight. But boy, it wasn't pretty. It was just an ugly fight, you know. We might as well show the whole fight so you can see uh, what emotions can do to you when you're competing. So stay far away from emotions, guys. This is so important because otherwise you're going to see a fight like this. All right, and here we go. Huge guy. Kengo Watanabe. And he will come right away, see? Right knee. Like I said, it is not going to be technical. 
because I'm an angry man here. A knee on the inside of his leg, a few body shots there, all to the liver, three of them. If you go to my website, baasroeden.tv, you will see actually a comic that they made about this fight, about the whole preparation of this guy, and uh, how it came all together. I was holding the ropes, that's what they were saying. So they gave me a warning. And here we go again. There was the liver kick. I was waiting for his right hand. Knee to the body. Not a knee to the body, but it was nicely blocked. Left shot to the body. You see, it's a little bit aggressive fighting. But it is because... Look, he's attacking me. Okay. Now I'm going to get my stuff together. Knee, right hook, and he's down. And he continues, showing the heart of a lion. So to give him a little bit extra rest, they're going to check him. Here we go, slow-mo, right knee, boom, right hook, right behind the air. And as you can see, although it's a palm strike, I hit with a bone. And I'm still very angry, so you will see me doing things in this fight that I pretty much never did before. Another left knee to the body. So apparently they're gonna give me a red card or something now. And more rest to the uh, opponent. And here we go again. Okay, now I'm getting really palm strike here. And watch this. Now I hit him when he's on the ground. And that would, it's legal. But I wouldn't do that before. They're going to have him. They're going to give him another timeout. Oh no, they're not. They're going to fight. They say if you go down one more time, it's over. And of course, I know that too. Down. It was a slip, more of a slip than a real takedown, than a real knockdown. Referee calls the fight, and that is the end. And that's it. I'm pretty sure, you know, if I start thinking about everything, there's much more that I can say. And if does, something does pop up, uh, I will write it down 
and then uh, hopefully you can make another video out of it because it's so important for people at home to understand that never break a winning combination. Oh, that's one that I forgot. Never break a winning combination. If you became a champion and you have a certain group around uh, people around you, and I've been saying this for the last 20 years, I tell everybody this, don't break that magic combination because somehow that is the combination that you started winning fights. You know, you see it sometimes with fighters, they suddenly, they trade in their women and they go for, for the updated model and they do all that stuff and then suddenly they start losing fights. Or they screw somebody over and then they start losing fights. Or they, they, they push a trainer out and they start losing fights. When you all became one, keep that combination. And even if you don't really like the person or something's going on, I would not take the risk. I can give you so many examples, which I'm not going to do, of course, but I can give you so many examples of fighters who have done that and then started losing and the careers were over. So I truly believe it is, you know, all together, we won. Let's keep that team together because what you don't realize is that they also went through with you through the losses and they were always backing you up and always backing you up. Well, all the other people, you know, you, it's like when you win. Oh, we won, we won. And when you lost, you lost, you lost. Suddenly it's the we is gone and suddenly it's you who did everything. But that's just, again, how we are wired. We're just thinking about the last fights Unfortunately for a lot of fighters, that's why I stopped fighting in Holland, right? Lost two fights in a row and suddenly I was the worst fighter. They forgot about my first nine knockouts. Uh, eight in the first round and one in the second round and, and now I was the worst. And I, I have to be honest, I, I wasn't a really great technical fighter when I was fighting because I was just a lot of power. But come on, give me a little bit of, you know, don't hit me so hard in the face, so to say, with words that I get, you know, that it's affecting me. And a lot of fighters, and somehow fighters, I don't know why this is, we have a thin skin because we train very hard. We do everything, everything. And it's not only to please us, it's, trust me, it's also to please you fans at home. So then suddenly when you lose one or two fights in a row and you become, the fighters start dropping you, I go, Ooh, stick with that, man. Stick with that fighter. You know, that's why it was so great for me. And that's why I'm so happy that I was fighting in Japan. In, in Japan, you can't lose as long as you're not quitting or tapping on a strike or doing something, pushing out. If you start doing that, oh, they don't like you. But if you fight tooth and nails with everything you got and you lose a fight, you won't lose one single fan. I had a guy, and I used this example before, I think he lost like six in a row and they were waiting in line for him. Why? Because he was an amazing fighter. The guy was just a very durable, tough guy and every other fighter was afraid to fight the guy. Yes, he might not be that good, but boy, he will come for you. You better be in shape. So keep supporting your fighters, winning or losing, it's important. I do have to say though that lately in life, you know, the last few years, actually fighters, uh, fans start doing that more often. So they give the, the fighters more of a chance. But in everything else, with actors, with politicians, with musicians, whatever they do, if they do something bad and they're on drugs or alcohol, alcohol, give them a pass. You know, put yourself in that same situation. Yeah, but I don't drink. Well, then try to visualize that same situation and find out that it's really not as bad. That's not the person. That was the person who was under influence for some, uh, from something. And uh, do you really want to kick him out just because of that? I had a guy who thought that... Um, uh, that I stole money from a bare knuckle organization. It was his whole thing. I, I, I went to, I'll, I'll make a whole piece about this. And he says, man, I was always a big fan and uh, now unfollow. And I go, you'll never be a big fan. I'm a huge fan of The Rock. Imagine D Dwayne Johnson, if something comes out, a story now about him, that he did something and without me checking and without me uh, watching him do the explanation, I drop him. I was never a fan. That's not a fan. A fan goes like, hey, let's first listen to Boss. Or let's first listen to The Rock. See what he has to say. And then do so homework because, dude, I really like that guy. Don't because you hear a story and you believe. Everybody can tell you a story. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Now, right now we live in a day and age that you, you know, you just have to say it and boom, you're it. And it, it's not true, you know. Uh, proven innocent until uh, proven guilty, it's gone. You're guilty. And even when you can prove your innocence, oh, there's always smoke when there's fire. That's the world we live in right now. Thankfully for fighters, when they lose, at least we don't have that as much anymore. But fighters make stupid mistakes. Come on, guys, we all make mistakes. So, Godspeed, judge people on what they did in their entire lives, not on their bad moments, and you're gonna be good to go. 
Hosu. And again, I'll explain it. Hosu, karate greeting. Comes from two Japanese words. Oshi sh uh, means push. And shinobu, which means endure. To push and to endure. And if you want to excel in life, whatever it is, doesn't matter whatever job it is, you're going to have to push and endure to get there. Right? So that's why this, the hosu, the, 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 that, that, that saying works for everybody else out there as well. Godspeed. Hosu. <laughs>